Uh, thank you all so much for joining today. Um, I'm Shane Orsop. I'm eLife's Community Manager for Outreach. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Promoting Open Science in and from the Global South. Uh, as you may have heard, the session is being recorded and will be made available on YouTube in the near future. So we'll be using Zoom to provide live captions today. Uh, to enable them on desktop, click the Show Captions button on the center button toolbar, and you can toggle them off by clicking the button again. And to enable the live captions on mobile, just click Captions on the bottom toolbar and toggle Show Captions, and you can turn them off using the same method. Uh, but if you're having difficulties, just let us know in the chat box. We'll be happy to help. So to give some context for today's session, uh, eLife is a non profit organization that operates a platform to improve all aspects of research communication by encouraging and recognizing the most responsible behaviors in research. So while our new mod publishing model has the potential to make publishing a more inclusive enterprise that offers the benefits of scholarly review or giving authors more agency in the publishing process, uh, in order to fulfill that potential, we need coordinated efforts and to hear from the communities most impacted by the inequity and the status quo. If you read more about eLife's new publishing model, including milestones and readings from the first year, and the following blog post, we'll share a link in the chat shortly. And so to this end, uh, we've established the Global South Committee for Open Science to learn directly from our peers in the Global South, so that we can strive to overcome these barriers in the pursuit of inclusive, equitable, and more diverse scientific communications. Today, we are joined by the committee's founding members, as you can see here. Uh, as well as three esteemed guest panelists who will discuss challenges, opportunities, and barriers for researchers in the Global South and share the collective vision for enhancing open science infrastructure and promotion. Following the panelists' presentations and discussions, we invite questions and comments from our audience. But before we jump into the content today, uh, I'd like to do a bit of housekeeping. Uh, so during the webinar, uh, the Code of Conduct from eLife uh, is in effect to all attendees and hosts. Uh, we ask that everybody please be respectful, honest, inclusive, accommodating, appreciative, and open to learning from everyone else. We ask you please do not attack, demean, disrupt, harass, or threaten others or encourage such behavior. Uh, and importantly, if you feel uncomfortable or unwelcome at any of our webinars, please feel free to contact eLife by email via eLife-safety-team at protonmail.com. So with that out of the way, uh, as we mentioned, this session is being recorded and will be made available on YouTube in the near future. But if you need help, please send a chat message directly to me today. Following the presentation, we'll be relaying your questions to our panelists. Uh, so to ask a question at any point during the webinar, you can type your question into Zoom's chat box. And today's session moderator, Mercury, will ask your question in the Q&A. Uh, with that said, please welcome Mercury to introduce the committee and our guest speakers. Thank you, Shin, for taking us through a nice introduction there. And it's really nice to see everybody who has uh, turned up uh, to, for today's webinar. We are looking forward to an interactive session, one which is engaging and one which will be able to help us be able to understand some of the things or challenges that we face uh, in promoting open science. So I would like to welcome eLife's uh, Global South Committee for Open Science today. And we also have uh, with us uh, guest panelists, uh, that is uh, Emmanuel Boake, Chung Pong, and Jessica Formoso. They will share with us first-hand experiences and insights towards promoting open science and practices, especially from the different regions they come from. And uh, personally, I'm really excited to hear what they will, would have to say. The Global South Committee for Open Science was initially formed in July 2023. Of course, we've had some teething here and there, and we've been going through the, the uh, foundation stage, and uh, it was brought together to bring researchers uh, from the different countries and territories that share similar characteristics, that uh, especially uh, in relation to our socioeconomics, politics, you know, culture, limited representation when it comes to policy and influence on key issues. And the term, we are using the word Global South here, even though it encompasses many different aspects uh, and we, we, we have still not yet reached to that place where we can say 
this is how we want to define this so this is just an evolving space and we know with time we are going to have a, a way in which we are def defining it uh, in relation to this particular committee the committee has been provided a dedicated space uh, by eLife that will be able to help us uh, you know, have or achieve greater involvement within science communication and innovation. And I would like to introduce uh, our members who we have here today. We are so grateful for making time to be present and also the work you've been doing uh, for from the time uh, this committee was joined. We have uh, Dean Roslin. She's from Kigali, Rwanda. So she represents Africa uh, and uh, we, by the way, let me just inform you that we have our committee members come from Africa, Asia, and uh, Asia, the Indian subcontinent, and Latin America. And we have Humberto Debat. He is from Argentina. We have Tao. He is from Thailand. Uh, we have Izu Okafo. He's from Nigeria. We have uh, Makiri Shichindo. That's me. I'm from Kenya. We have Mohamed Hossein from Bangladesh, and uh, we have Nurul Izati from Indonesia, and uh, finally, but not least, we have Olavo Amaral from Brazil. So we are also hoping that this year we will be able to recruit additional members via an open call, which will be able to enhance our geographical representation and be able to also ensure we have gender parity. To be able to be eligible to apply, uh, prospective candidates should be at least practicing researchers in the field of biomedical and life sciences and must live and work in the country or territory within the defined regions of Global South. So a lot more of this information will, will be provided uh, before the end of this particular webinar and also uh, through the website which will be provided here. So I uh, would also just want to say that some of the things we do as a committee is meet monthly, where we've been able to establish the core infrastructure, which includes the terms of reference, and be able to work on some of the uh, key principles that, that define the committee. With that, I would like to uh, ask uh, two of our members to be able to provide us or just speak to us more about what the committee is all about. So I will start with uh, Rosalind, uh, who will be able to introduce the committee's vision and scope and discuss some of these principles. Thank you, Rosalind, please. Thank you, uh, Mercury. My name is Tini Rosalind, as uh, Mercury had introduced. Um, originally from Cameroon, I'm a Cameroonian, but I'm based in Rwanda. So today I'm going to be talking to us about the committee's vision and scope. Sorry for my bad voice, I got a call. And uh, as members of uh, the Global South Committee for Open Science, we are looking forward to being a leading and sustainable network in the Global South that is going to be promoting and facilitating the growth of open science in the next 10 years and beyond. Through this, we hope to bring forward a community where the voices of global science researchers will be heard through scientific communication and as well attending such um, scientific events in order to make sure that the voices of these um, global South researchers are heard far and near. We're also looking forward to creating and exploring safe spaces and opportunities to make sure that the voices of global South researchers are heard. By doing this, we are looking forward to organizing about a minimum of two events or opportunities each year. We're also looking forward to leveraging from um, eLive's presence by using um, their resources in organizing workshops and programs, and also promoting preprint hubs and activities. In that light, for this um, inaugural um, team, we are doing, uh, we are specifically developing and implementing target awareness programs on open access principles and the benefits of open sharing work, 
especially for researchers from remote and small institutions. We're also looking forward to um, building capacities uh, aimed at supporting researchers in effectively adopting open science. And we are advocating for the inclusion of open access in scholarships, appraisals, and assessment, along with the establishment of awards or recognition. And then we want to seek avenues for incorporating open access practices in scholarship appraisal. So these four key areas, these are the areas we wish to, we hope to contribute to as the inaugural members of the Global South Committee for Healing Life. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for taking us through the, the vision, uh, despite uh, you struggling with uh, your voice, but we were able to hear you clearly. Thank you for that. I would now like to ask Olavo to just take us through the next slides, please. You'll uh, be able to. Uh, Jacquet, next. Yeah, so uh, this recurrent distribution is still uh, very much patchy. Uh, the Global South is a very heterogeneous construct. I mean, there's huge differences between Brazil, uh, Kenya, Thailand, and uh, China. So, I mean, I mean, uh, we're representing something that's much bigger than where we actually come from. Uh, we'd definitely like to in in improve our distribution. I mean, we have people from Africa, from uh, Bangladesh, from uh, Southeast Asia, from Latin America, but I mean that there are still huge gaps on the map. Uh, most of East Asia, uh, uh, the Caribbean, the Pacific Islands. We have had people from the Caribbean and the Middle East. Uh, they left during the process, but uh, we definitely want to increase this coverage here. I mean, we should be fitting these blank areas on the map in order to be really speaking for a larger diversity of, of countries, because really, I, I think the scenarios are very, very different. Uh, next. In this sense, uh, we should uh, we, we want to 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 improve the diversity of the community, particularly the <clears throat> geographical diversity, <clears throat> while keeping in touch with other forms of diversity as well. We should uh, understate, uh, undertake a next phase of recruitment now through an open call. So, like these first spots were filled by invitations, but uh, we definitely want to be uh, more open to people who want to join. So, uh, we should uh, put put up an open call in the second half of the year uh, following uh, the. Uh, EDI uh, the life principles and uh, hopefully this will make I mean we'll have more hands to work on stuff and this will also make the, the committee more diverse more representative uh, and this is what I had to say I now pass on to the speakers who are the invited ones I guess Mercury should be presenting them Thank you very much uh, for for taking us through the diversity and also the demographics. And uh, in case we have any questions, just put them in the chat box. We'll be able to tackle this uh, at, after we listen to our guest speakers today. So now we get to the most exciting session where we will have our first uh, guest speaker. Uh, we we have three, as I had mentioned, and Emmanuel is going to take us through the first, uh, he'll be our first speaker, our first guest speaker today. Emmanuel is a dedicated open science advocate in Africa. He collaborated with the Association of Africa's Univers Africa, Association of African Universities and the Center for Open Science and as uh, 2022 eLife Community Ambassador. He's also the founder and director of Africa Reproducibility Network. He works to bridge gaps in open science advocacy and ad adoption. And we are really looking forward to hear from you. Thank you very much, Mercury, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm Emmanuel Boachi, and I'm currently co-leading RN with Lamis Akel, who's also a 2022 eLife Community Ambassador. Um, so I'm going to talk about our vision and experiences so far in setting up RN. Um, thank you very much so far. So uh, you realize that in the past few years, there's a lot that has happened in terms of the global space concerning promoting open science across the research ecosystem. So in 2021, UNESCO came up with a recommendation on open science, which served as a global framework. Then in 2022, AAU, I mean, dubbed their yearly celebration, Open Science Bringing Equity to Research and Publishing. And they brought together a lot of, I mean, stakeholders across the African research ecosystem to kind of talk about how they can integrate open science in the research and publishing space. Then we, we, um, in 2023, NASA declared the year, the year as um, a year for open science, which was an interesting um, development. And then this year too, in April, we had um, the Barcelona Declaration on um, Open Research Information. 
So we realize that a lot is happening globally in terms of promoting open science, but then we ask ourselves the question, are researchers here aware of what is going on? And are they aware of the requirements these developments place on them as researchers who are part of the global research ecosystem? So that is why we established RN as a community-led initiative that is trying to bridge the gaps in open science advocacy and adoption across the African continent. So we are looking at what is happening. Are the researchers away? Um, what are the requirements these are placing on the researchers? How can we prepare them to kind of meet these requirements? And, and then how can we support them through communities? So our main goal is to target grassroots research. So we are looking at the researchers that are the research institutes or uh, universities across Africa. And we are looking at how we can prepare them. So we, we, are, we are looking at offering training, offering support, establishing communities so that when this increasing global demand for openness and research arrives at their institutions or within their communities, they will not be found struggling. They will be kind of ready. They will know about what open science is. They will know about what open science requires of them. They would already know about their practices and maybe engage in some of them. And they would have individuals within their communities to kind of provide support for them when they are trying to adopt open research principles. And what Aaron is trying to do is that we are not reinventing the wheel. We are looking at complementing existing efforts. So Aaron is part of a, a global um, family of reproducibility networks. And we have um, one in Brazil, which I, I believe Olavo is part of. We have one in Canada. Um, we have um, the, uh, the first one that was established in UK, and we have several across um, Europe and also one in Australia. So we are not reinventing the wheel, but we are looking at existing efforts and how we can complement this. And also another way we go about this is to partner with pro OS initiatives. So we are looking at organizations like Preview, we are looking at organizations like Fort, and then we are looking at organizations like let's ASA Bio. So these are pro OS initiatives. So rather than do it everything I mean, from scratch, we are looking at these organizations that exist that are promoting open science. And, and, and eLife was one of our first partners that we had because it's an eLife and Muslim um, um, led initiative. So we are doing this to ensure that um, what we are, what the solutions we are presenting already meets what the, what the community has established, the structures that the community has established, the, the um, outcomes that have come out from the community and how we can come up with sustainable ways. We look at our community and say, okay, let us collaborate with these existing communities and develop sustainable approaches that will offer measurable long-term impact. So the idea is not just to collaborate or complement with this um, existing pro OS initiatives. You want to find a way to develop approaches that are measurable and sustainable. And there is a way we go about this. And one of the ways, the major way we go about this is trying to understand the different community needs that we have. So RN was launched in 2023, November 2023. And when we were getting launched, uh, we had about 18 members from 15 countries. And within, um, from that time till now, we've, we've grown remarkably with 250 members from 27 African countries. And this is, this is a sign of the interest in what we are trying to do, how people are interested in the ideology that we are putting across. And we're able to get this data through our sign-up form. So even before we launched, I mean, we had a sign-up form and it was mainly for Africans. So we said, if you are interested in being part of our community, then use the sign-up form. And the sign-up form is not just to get data about where they are coming from or their research background, but it also assesses how they understand open science. Price. So we ask them questions around the, the various principles and aspects of open science and then know their level of an awareness or understanding. And this helps us determine the level of the training that we should deliver to them. So if you, you know that our community is, let's say, generally um, new to open science, then if you are developing a training program, we'll make it very basic. So it helps us understand individual awareness about OS, and it also helps us assess our reach because if you have, let's say, 50 people signing up uh, to join our community or check our community data and realize that we have 50 people from, let's say, Nigeria, but just two from, let's say, Ghana, it tells us that probably researchers in Nigeria are more connected to platforms that share information about open science as compared to, let's say, researchers in Ghana. So this helps us assess our reach and then the avenues we use to kind of communicate to the research community in Africa and also identify marginalized or underrepresented communities. So when we realize that we have little representation, it may be, although it's not conclusive, it may be that this is due to the fact that that community is underrepresented. Although um, there's a lot of activity going on in terms of promoting open science in Africa, this, this is quite dispersed, right? The levels are not the same across different countries. So we want to know which countries have greater awareness and which countries have lesser awareness and how we can kind of reach these communities and then help support them. This is one of the reasons why we, we created the sign-up form. 
And then what we after after we have our uh, we have our point, we said that um after getting this information, what can we do? Let us offer these basic trainings for them. So we've been organizing a number of training sessions for our community this at the community level. So we've had a number of sessions on introduction to open science. So what these sessions normally are about is just to let them understand what open science is from what it's trying to do to what led to it coming up to what is going on within open science. What are the benefits? What are the challenges? What can we do about it? And we normally organize the sessions uh, as discussion sessions. So we do the presentation and there's a lengthy time for discussions to kind of get feedback. And we, I would say we are lucky to we are lucky to have a very, very interactive and collaborative community that just gives us a lot of information about what is possible, what is not possible, what are the challenges they are facing. So we've been having these sessions to kind of know what is going on within the communities and how we can also help them. And another way we do this is the working groups. So the idea of the working groups is to find localized groups of either people from the same country or people from the same discipline. We've already launched the, the library and information science working group. And what these working groups will do is that they help us, they kind of take the lead to help us understand what has been going on within the country or discipline in terms of promoting open science. Um, are these um, interventions working? If they didn't work, what were the challenges? What are the ways we can kind of support them or what are the uh, solutions that we can present that will actually meet the needs of the country or the discipline. So this is one of the reasons why we set up the working group. And um, so far, we've been able to launch one and I'm looking forward to uh, launching several others. So the idea is not to just set up a community and get their data and then offer training sessions. No, we want to ensure that the trainings that we offer are tailored to the needs of the communities. And that's why we are, we are creating a very collaborative community where people within the various disciplines or countries are leading how we'll be able to understand this, this um, in communities. And the interesting part is that the working groups are not just providing information to us, they will also lead the implementation phase. So when they when they come up with the with their recommendations, the implementation will be done together with them. So it's not like you get the information and then just come up with a solution. No, the working group is going to lead the implementation so that they they they, they are more relatable. The community feels like it's our own people that are trying to do this. So maybe they, they, they understand us better, right? So it makes the interaction very, very easy. So that's one of the ways that we've been doing this. And then aside, there's a major way that we've also moved is through the, the local network lead program. So the reason why we came up with the local network lead program, rather than just organize a number of training sessions and et cetera for our community, is that we wanted to build a strong network, a very strong network of open science advocates who can provide long-term support so the idea is not to offer training to people who are just interested in learning about open science and then using it for themselves no we are interested in people that are saying we know that open science is good it's important we know that it's going to change how research is done and we want to be involved in kind of advocating for it and providing support for our community and this is the reason why we launched so we opened it um early this year and we had over 100 applications and we reviewed it based on the criteria that we are supposed to have people on and we had about 71 uh, uh, that we have moved to the, um, the, the training program. And the training is tiered because from the from the information we have, we realize that it is better to kind of start from basic, then you go to a little bit advanced, then you go to how they can lead their community. So we have the level one, which kind of introduces them to the various open science concepts. So you introduce them to open science, then they had introduction to some of the open research principles, such as, I mean, footprint, open peer review, open source reproducibility. So they had introductory sessions where they just got to understand this, these principles and concepts. Then the next level, which is currently running level two, is where they learn how they can integrate some of these principles into their research work. So it's like, how can I make my research reproducible? What are the tools, platforms, resources that I can use? So that is the, 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 the second level. And then we're looking at the third level where we know they are going to lead communities and when it's not easy. There's not easy kind of building or leading a community. So level three is more about how they can Lead their community. We have sessions around leadership, how to develop, I mean, the training materials for making research practices and etc. And we uh, we partnered with pro OS organizations. So we are not doing everything on our own. We are we got the experts from existing organizations like eLife, like um, um ASAP Bio, like Preview, like Ford. So these are people um, who are aware of these things, who are well versed in these things. They have, they have experience, and then it's also a learning um, experience for our trainers because they get a lot of feedback from our trainings as to what is possible and what is not possible. And what we've done is that it is a six-month program, an intensive six-month program. It seems a bit small, especially for um, researchers who, are, who have a lot on their plate. But we structured this in a way that we will know the people that are really interested because 
Uh, we learned so far that a lot of people may sign up to a training program, but may not even attend a single one of them. And because this is not just a training program, it's supposed to kind of provide community leaders. We have, we have to find a way to know which people are really interested. So it's being six months and being tiered helps us at, at each level to review the people that are really participating so that we will know that these are the ones that are passionate and dedicated to promoting best research projects across Africa. So like I was saying, it's tiered. So the prime, level one is primary in-depth, level two is about how they integrate and level three is about how they develop these training materials. And of course, RN is relatively new um, and uh, we are now doing a lot of the things that we are doing. So we have to know how it's actually going to impact the community, but we are excited about, about the retains that we've had so far and the, the interest we've had from the community in Africa and globally and the support to So we are quite excited about what is to come. So I'm sure during the Q&A section, we'll be able to share a lot of the experiences that we've had and then how we can also work together towards promoting the rights and the global side. Thank you very much. So back to you, Matthew. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for sharing with us the great work you're doing. And I'm sure people will have questions afterwards uh, to find out more about what, what, what's happening. Uh, we will now go to our next panelist. That's Chung Pong. We, we want to hear more about uh, the work that you do. Uh, he's a faculty member at the School of Psychology, Nanjing Nom Normal University, that's in China. His interests are in lying, cognitive modeling, self-recognition, and meta-science. He initiated the Chinese Open Science Network, that's COSN, or COSN, and leads projects to create practical open science and reproducibility guides for researchers in developing countries. Welcome. We really look forward to hearing more about what you do. Thank you, Macri. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, I'm Hu Chuanpeng, uh, a faculty member at the School of Nanjing uh, Normal University. So by the way, um, <laughs> I found that people may ask me what, why there's a uh, normal in the university's name. So there's no abnormal university. Uh, the normal here was translated based on French, tran uh, French uh, école normal, because our university was originally designed for training teachers. But later, it's just like other universities in China, uh, including uh, different disciplines and departments ranging from science to humanity. So I'm all here on behalf of the Chinese Open Science Network. Um, so before I introduce our network, uh, let's ask you a question. What does mean for what does open science mean to you? So next. I guess based on your background, open science means different things to you. Uh, for some of you, it may mean uh, open access. For some of you, it may mean open, soft, uh, open source software or open data, open script. Uh, or for some of you, it may even mean citizen science, right? Yeah, next. That's great. So as, next, as a psychologist or uh, as a graduate student who are trained in psychology, um, open science actually means replication crisis to me and uh, to many of us. Next. So uh, as you may know, in 2015, there was a famous paper published in uh, Science, which trying to estimate the reproducibility of psychological science. So which become a big news in across the whole science community. Uh, so part of, uh, well, many of uh, researchers in psychology trying to overcome uh, this crisis at the same time, next, for many of us, uh, the problem maybe goes even earlier. Uh, around 2011 and 2012, there was a big scandal, um, which, uh, so a, a Dutch social psychologist was found to um, like uh, faked his data in more than 50 papers, so which become a quite big issue uh, in the whole field. So for some of us, it means that um, uh, our failure to detect fraud in our peer review or post publication phase. So open science for us means actually we're trying to address the fraud, uh, massive fraud and uh, replication crisis. Next. So because of this big events and uh, many changes has happened in psychology, just as Andrew Gilman put it here, the wind has changed. Uh, it was during my PhD, and um, 
there are so many changes in the field. So we have the so-called open science movement. Uh, general articles requires open data, open script, and the new statistics are required, or many new open soft uh, open source software are provided and become the new standards. We also have new practices like pre-registration, which means you need to register your research protocol, your research plan before you collect the data. So we have all kinds of changes and uh, so many changes happen so fast. As an early career researcher, what should we do? Next. So maybe uh, we just embrace the change, right? Try to learn from the new practices, or we can wait for uh, some senior researchers to guide us for action. At that time, I think a lot of change has already happened in the, in the international community, but uh, upon the publication of the science paper we just mentioned, um, there was few public discussion about replication crisis and the change in policy in Chinese. So we have waited for a while, but uh, in 2015, we decided to do something instead of just uh, keep waiting. So next. So we drafted a Chinese paper to introduce the whole reproducibility crisis thing and the open science movement. And we submitted it to a um, Chinese journal because we hope that more colleagues, especially early career researchers can learn from it. Uh, know what was happening uh, in the international community. Um, unexpectedly, reviews comments was positive and uh, invited us to revise and resubmit. And then the publish the, the paper was published in Chinese. Uh, the next, encouraged by the acceptance of this paper, we we applied to host a workshop uh, on the reproducibility issue and uh, open science prior the annual conference of Chinese Psychology Society and uh, we was approved again. This was the first time, um, this was the first workshop on open science and reproducibility in the Chinese Psychology Society. And the number of participants were higher than we expected. Next. So we get started and we have the second workshop and we created WeChat official account of open science. We choose WeChat instead of other social media because WeChat is the most widely uh, used social media apps in China. So basically, almost everyone uses WeChat in China. Uh, and also, we have um, we use WeChat official account because because it serves as like a blog service. So you can post article on your official account and you can share it with your friends and in your social network. And also we created a WeChat group, which just like the WhatsApp group. You can have discussion, uh, like uh, have initiate some instant conversation in group. Next. And then we're starting to organize more events. Most of them happening online. We have a journal club because which is easier to organize. And then we um, organize open talks uh, because then come the, uh, pandemic, we have to stay at home and uh, we start to invite speakers to give talk online. So here is the short history of Chinese open science network. Uh, next. And we have a fancy version in our 20, 2023 paper. Next. <clears throat> so the status of uh, Chinese open science network, we have uh, multiple social media channels but we primarily rely on, so, on WeChat. Uh, we also have uh, OSF to host some, some materials and sometimes we post uh, information on Twitter as well, but still the primary channel is WeChat because uh, most researchers, um, they rely on WeChat as well. Next. Um, the current Chinese Open Science Network have two committees or two teams. One is for the steering committee. Uh, most of us are early career researchers and our responsibility is to organize online events and in-person events. And we also have um, like a division of our responsibility. We have a different subcommittees for each type of event. I will mention it later. We also have uh, a specialized editing team for our WeChat official account because we need to 
edit our uh, uh, articles and post online, just as eLife community need to post blogs and uh, announcement on the internet. We post it on WeChat. So most of them are volunteers and uh, not paid. And their responsibility is type 13 video editing and translating and uh, uh, this kind of trivial but uh, vital things for our network. Next. So now we organize a series of events. Uh, most of them are online. Uh, we have open talks, as I just mentioned, uh, which we will invite speakers to give us a uh, talk about their research or about experience in doing in embracing open science practices. Uh, usually we will invite early career researchers to introduce their own research to increase the visibility of, of their research, of their studies. We also invite experienced researchers to uh, give us guidance on how to uh, embrace open science practice. For example, we, uh, we previously invited Russia Patrick and Michael Frank from Stanford, and also Samia Vesa from uh, Melbourne, Australia. And the second series is Open Minds. We call it Open Minds because we hope that the people uh, have a, are open-minded to discuss the articles related to reproducibility and open science because these practices are different from what we have trained. So uh, we have these general theories for a few years and we read papers related to reproducibility and uh, open science, primarily um, written by psychologists or psychological research. It's just like reproducibility, the one initiated from UK. Uh, we also have open tutorials, which uh, where we will invite postdoc or senior PhD students to share their experience, skills, or some practical hands-on techniques. Uh, finally, we have Open Plus. So we have this kind of special events where we invite panelists to discuss some specific topics, for example, uh, about the pros and cons of staying in academia or going to industry or sharing experience of being a new principal investigator. Um, so these are our like major events. We also translate uh, English articles and the blog posts that are valuable for our readers. Because um, I think in in China, because we our official language is Mandarin and uh, being fluent in English actually is a privileged thing. So um, we try to lower the language barrier and uh, translate many of the materials to, to our readers. For example, we have uh, translated the 10 common statistical error published uh, in eLife. And we also have um, uh, organized, continue organizing in-person events like hackathons and workshops. And um, additionally, we will like, uh, we often offer our WeChat official account as a platform for researchers to call for collaborators. Uh, usually, uh, they call for collaborators for doing meta science. Next. So here is the summary of our our events. Um, it was um, summarized in this year, a book chapter we contributed to. Uh, but uh, the, the, the records are, can, are growing as well. So next. Uh, here is an example of our translation. So we we found that the 10 common statistical mistakes, which is quite useful for most uh, uh, biomedical or psychology researchers. So we translated it into Chinese and we posted it on our uh, official account and which become the third uh, mostly read articles on our official account. Next. We have also organized uh, many in-person events. Most of them are workshop and hackathon so that we can uh, teach, train people about how to use uh, open science infrastructure like open science framework or the policy change in journals and, and something like that. Basically to promote uh, the awareness of open science. Next. So we, we as a grassroots not network promoting open science, but we are a lot along. Firstly, we get a lot of support from international community. Uh, I joined, 
I, I joined uh, the, I became an uh, ambassador of the Center for Open Science, like in 2016. So I got, a, got some training and feedback from them. And I was currently a member of the executive committee of the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science. This society is very, uh, like they have a lot of organized, a lot of events, um, especially like a new conference to help people to uh, train with the latest technology and uh, open science practices. And I also participated in the psychological science accelerator, being part of the big team science and uh, learned a lot from, from them. Next. In China, we are a lot along either. So um, the Chinese government has uh, been part of the uh, UNESCO's open science recommendation. So the government actually is trying to support or promoting open science. So we have several infrastructure has been built. For example, preprint uh, platform China archive, a repository for, 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 store, for storing scientific data, science data bank, and we also have an open science platform built by, created by Institute of Psychology, uh, Chinese Academy of Science, which provide a um, platform for, for registration. So um, we together with this, uh, like governmental agencies and the Institute together to promote open science. So last year we have a Suzhou manifesto uh, in which the Chinese journal, Chinese psychological journals uh, have an announcement to encourage open science practices on general level. Next. So as a grassroots network, primarily uh, by early career researchers, we have our unique contributions compared with this international organization or um, this open science infrastructure built by the government agency. So I summarize it as we are trying to solve the last mile problem in delivering open science practices for early career researchers. Because we are grassroots network, so we are friendly to early career researchers. And we focus on methods and practices. So it's very practical and that will be valuable to early career researchers. And we endorse the value of diversity, equity, and, in, and inclusivity. So which means we don't exclude anyone from participating in our online events or contributing to us. Uh, which will give early career researcher more a lot of opportunity to um, engage and contribute and learn. And uh, finally, we're trying to reach the local community with the international community because we uh, okay, we will invite a speaker from international community to give talk and uh, trying to build collaboration. So we connect our early career researchers with the English or international community. And uh, next. So another co unique contribution is that uh, because the existence of Chinese Open Science Network, we are encouraging early career researchers to initiate their own focused online community. For example, in recent two or three years, there are other focused group uh, or focused online community was developing. Uh, for example, the Mind RL Hub, which actually is a very specialized community for focusing on reinforcement learning and the DDM JC, which is which means Drift Diffusion Model Journal Club, which focus on computation modeling. Um, and we also have a psycho method online group, which will uh, discuss what kinds of psychological methods. And um, most of the speakers and attenders are, most, are early career researchers. And next. Of course, we, uh, as a grassroots network, we have uh, challenges, the big ones. We are constantly in lack of funding. So most of our work are done by volunteers. Uh, our members of executive executive committee are also doing the work uh, for free. And uh, often we do not have enough people. So we have many good ideas, but we never have time to implement them just because the lack of funding or lack of people. For example, we have discussed the idea of creating a series of tutorial recorded and put it online for open science practices, but we have never started yet. Also, um, unlike uh, the other international organization, um, 
So it is relatively easier to register as a non-government or non-profit organization. Uh, but uh, because of the regulation in, in mainland China, we have difficulty to register as a, a non-profit non -profit organization. So the future plan, of course, because our biggest challenge is uh, is to survive. So the future plan, survival is on our, on, our, on the top of our priority. We we we're always trying to uh, make our like our organization our network keep running, uh, so that uh, even we have many great ideas, we we will decide we we will like decide not to do it because we will keep doing what we are doing now because that will help, help us to survive. And uh, we are trying to uh, have a better organization and we try then to learn from SIPS, FORT and other international organization. And, um, but um, we're not, uh, uh, I think we have a lot to do. And we're also trying to have more collaborations with other international or, uh, or domestic organizations. And uh, finally, uh, we are thinking with, we're tossing around the idea that maybe we should start a, a, a company or register as a company, but uh, our goal will still be nonprofit because uh, I think there was another gra grassroots network in China. They are doing the same, they are adapting the same strategy. Uh, so one thing I, I one, one thing worth mentioning is that um, we're actually trying to collaborate with uh, researchers from other de developing countries to have a practical guide for implementing open science practices. Uh, because we are, uh, most of us are in psychological science, so this will be primarily focused on doing research uh, in psychological science. So before closing, we have uh, some some tips for community building as well, uh, which has been summarized in our 2023 and 2014 publications. Uh, I think primarily uh, is that we need to be uh, optimistic and uh, and also be practical and be local. So finally, I want to um, express my gratitude for uh, those uh, parties or uh, Collaborators helped me to survive in academia. Firstly, I would uh, uh, and I like to thank my employer, so the Nanjing Normal University, to employ me so that I can still stay in academia. I would also like to thank my collaborators, Dr. Zhuo, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Foster, and um, uh, Dr. Sabara. And uh, next, I would like to thank all the the whole Chinese Open Science Network team, and um, so. Uh, we welcome any form of collaboration in the future. If you need help in reaching the researcher in in reaching Chinese community, you can we can always help you to spread the word. Thank you. Thank you very much for that elaborate uh, presentation. Um, I'm sure we have people going to come back to you with some questions. Looking forward to that. Now we want to welcome our final panelists, final but not least. And we are also looking forward to hearing from you, Jessica Fumoso. She is a cognitive psychologist from the University of Buenos Aires and a tenured uh, researcher at the National Scientific and Technical Research Council, that's CONISAT in Argentina. Since 2022, Jessica has been a dedicated member of Meta Docencia. Jessica, you will have to repeat some of this, some of these words in case they come up. Currently serving as the impact measurement coordinator and instructor. She's she also co-leads the R Ladies Buenos Aires chapter and participates in the Carpentries, where she contributes as a trainer and instructor. You're most welcome to lead us into this presentation looking forward thanks hi everyone and thank you mercury for the presentation especially because i i think i threw every complicated word in spanish i could find into there so thanks um well before i start um this section of the presentation is openly available in the in Senado. 
under a CC BY license. This means you can reuse it, modify it, and reference it if it's useful to you for something. So, um, alongside the wonderful group of people you can see in the slide, uh, I am part of an organization that is called Metadocencia. One of, of our objectives is to help uh, ad advance open science in Latin American uh, communities with a local perspective. We know the Global South faces unique challenges in implementing these practices. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the barriers researchers in Latin America face in implementing open science and open practices and some of the initiatives we are carrying out to try to mitigate some of them. Uh, next slide. So, um, a very frequent concern is extractivism, the risk of ideas and data being used uh, by external entities without proper acknowledgement or benefit uh, to the original researcher, especially when there is an asymmetry of resources and an asymmetry of resources and power. Yeah. Then you have financial limitations, the high costs associated uh, to publishing, for example, in open access journals are prohibited for many researchers. It's prohibited for this researcher also. Um, and there is little formal funding dedicated to open science initiatives. Uh, then you have institutional and cultural limitations. Uh, traditional academic cultures often resist change. Um, they prioritize individual accomplishment over collaboration. Incentives and recognition for practice in open science are limited. Um, the metrics used to measure academic success do not favor open science output around here. For example, open access publications are often undervalued in promotion processes or evaluation processes. And there is immense pressure to publish in high impact journals rather than open access ones. At the same time, there is a lack of national, national and institutional policy support in open science. So the metrics used to assess researchers reflect that. Language is also a huge barrier. Um, training opportunities, as well as most of the platforms used to implement open practices and the resources that are available uh, around the internet are predominantly in English and also many scientific publications as well. So this, this not only makes them less accessible to researchers, but also to the community that, that would ultimately benefit from the outcome of the research. So we need multi-language publications. Uh, we, have, we had a good experience uh, with, um, uh, how do you call this? The, with a reflection piece that some members of Metadocencia wrote together with uh, other researchers about ethical challenges that uh, generative artificial intelligence poses on uh, poses to open science. This was published in Nature, Nature of Human Behavior, and it was published both in English and in Spanish simultaneously, so you can find both versions. But this is not a common practice. It could be, but it's not, and we are mostly forced to work and read and write in English. Another limitation is that researchers here are overworked, I guess everywhere, but I can speak for from the local experience. And implementing open science practices can significantly increase their workload. And when collaboration and open practices are not recognized and do not impact um, in their career advancements, uh, then there's really very little initiative to adopt these practices. Finally, many institutions as well as Individual researchers lack um, the servers and technical resources required to run programs and store data efficiently. So um, in our attempt to mitigate, to help mitigate some of these barriers, we invest in community building and the co-creation of networks. Uh, this is one of Metallocencia's pillars. Researchers need support 
and there are many organizations and communities of practice in the global south which seek to enhance research capacity through infrastructure, um, open access education, open data initiatives, uh, funding opportunities, but we don't always know them. So in 2023, we started the Panel de Comunidades Amigas, Fellow Communities Hive. So this Fellow Communities Hive is a collaborative effort in which we aim to showcase and amplify opportunities and proposals that are made by these um, communities that are part of the panel, which is what you're seeing right now in the slide. Those are all the communities that are currently part of our hive and that it, it's growing all the time, but these are the, the ones with the less additions. And we think that working together, amplifying our proposals, this will ultimately sustain and multiply, multiply the implementation of um, open science practices. We also have over 800 members in our Slack and over 2,400 subscribers to our newsletter. So we are quite happy because the community is really growing, is thriving. So another key pillar for us is establishing learning spaces to foster capacity building, which is how we initially began. In 2020, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, because of the need to maintain social distance, many educators had to transition their classes to virtual platforms without any prior experience or training, most of the time without any kind of support from their institution. So a group of researchers and educators um, that had experience with this, some of them were involved in the Carpentries, which is another organization, and Our Lady, they got together and created this community to teach best practices for teaching online in Spanish. Um, I actually um, found out about Metaocencia this way. I needed training and I didn't find, I couldn't find any other resources available and it was it was great. Um, so in 2023, we got involved in NASA um, with the NASA Transform to Open Science Initiative. This initiative was designed to transform agencies, organizations, and communities to an, incl an inclusive um, culture of open science. For that, they have well, they have many um, initiatives, but one specifically was create a curriculum, the NASA Open Science 101 curriculum, to introduce people to definitions, tools, and resources, and um, recommendations on best practices uh, regarding open science. But this was all in English and centered in the United States. Uh, United States. Next slide. We were awarded a grant to contextualize the Open Science 101 curriculum in Spanish and uh, to teach this material to virtual cohort. We had a first experimental cohort that was called uh, Mission, Mission Exploración. I think it would translate to Mission Exploration, I think. Uh, this was a six-week cohort where we gathered to study the materials in English while speaking in Spanish. This allowed us to get several persons certified with this curriculum. Um, and we also, it also helps us, helps, helped us uh, start having inputs about the materials, but from the Spanish speaking community. 69 people from 13 countries signed up. The group was highly interdisciplinary. It attracted both open science beginners and experts, uh, which created a unique space for exchanging experiences and addressing doubts and building networks. 58% I think uh, showing our Slack and continue to participate. Some of that got some of them got involved in other projects. Many kept posting training opportunities, job opportunities, resources. So this was uh, for us it was a success in making our community grow. Um, after each course, 
we administer a survey to participants uh, where we ask them to rate how likely they are to recommend the course they took and also to provide feedback on what work, worked well and what could be improved based on the responses of, of the, the people that participate of Mission Exploración. Uh, we achieved a net promoter score of 72%, which is considered very good. It goes from uh, minus 100 to 100, so 72. We like it. Um, positive feedback highlighted the value of conducting the, uh, conducting the sections in Spanish and the um, discussions that emerged about how the NASA material translated to the Latin American concept. And things to improve were mostly related to, well, we need more time to discuss this, and also we need the materials to be in Spanish. So the 26th, 26th of June, so next week, we are launching the first official cohort, which we call Alta Ciencia Abierta. This stands for uh, Latin America Transformed to Open Science, but in Spanish. Um, 111 people signed up. Uh, within the first week, we actually had to rush to close the sign-up form and open the one for the next cohort that starts at the end of August. Again, people signed up from 13 different countries, and we have participants from social sciences, um, humanities, health sciences, STEM fields. It's, again, very interdisciplinary, so we're expecting an, a very rich exchange uh, to happen. This cohort will also last six weeks, and it will allow participants to get certified both by Metal Sancia and by NAFTA you get a very huge budge to put in LinkedIn. Um, uh, next slide. The third pillar of Metal Sencia is providing accessible, accessible resources for Spanish-speaking communities. This pillar is centered in two methods. One is contextualizing materials into Spanish, and the other one is creating multilingual resources. So contextualizing implies translating and adapting existing resources to ensure that they are culturally relevant and easily understood. We want the content to reflect the challenges and opportunities faced, faced by Spanish-speaking communities in Latin America. Yeah. And because we want the product to reflect as many voices as possible, we make it a community effort. So what do we do? What did we do with the Open Science 101 curriculum? Well, we had 18 participants uh, from Argentina, Mexico, and Bolivia translate the material. We use a platform that is called Crowding that allows for collaborative translation. And it has a lot of um, features that help translate very a lot faster. Um, and also you can integrate, we integrated crowding with GitHub. So when we finish this process and we upload everything, there, there's a lot of material already on there. Uh, anyone, anywhere can access it and can submit an issue and make suggestions to improve the material. Yeah. Uh, we use Slack to post queries. So whenever anybody of the people that were translated had a doubt about how to translate something, they would post it on Slack. And anyone on the Slack community could participate, giving an opinion, uh, citing sources, what, uh, whatever they, they felt was relevant. Uh, we had weekly synchronous co-working hour. We did two rounds, one for translation and one for review. And with this, all these uh, workflow. It took us two months and a half to translate over 87,300 words, uh, 102 images and two videos. We made several agreements to ensure that the materials are accessible to all speaking, uh, sorry, Spanish speaking Latin American communities. There's a lot of bar um, variety in accents and 
in words. So we wanted to make it as neutral as possible. And we used all these agreements to create a um, contextualization guide and also a glossary for technical terms, which are both will be both available for anyone to consult. Um, additionally, we are currently collecting stories of open science from across Latin America to include local examples in the final product. And because, again, this will be available in GitHub, anyone can raise an issue, make a suggestion to improve them. And all those contributions are the benefit of making, the benefit of giving feedback through these uh, tools like GitHub is that the contributions you make are registered for anybody to see. Um, well, um, at the beginning, I mentioned a huge list of limitations, and you've seen that we've only addressed a few. Well, we do, we do what we can, but uh, we really believe that knowing about open science and open practices and how to implement them, having accessible resources at your disposal, disposal at no cost and accessible also implies language. And having a community that supports you are the starting points to eventually achieve um, a cultural change that impacts uh, the research community as a whole. So I really enjoyed the other panelists' presentations. I love that we are people here is from everywhere. And I think that this really, this way of working as a community and building bridges and building networks is the way to go. So thank you very much. I hope this wasn't too long because I wasn't taking time. Uh, Mercury, I'll leave you the floor, the floor, the stage. I'm not sure how to say it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all the presenters. And uh, it was really great to see how, all of you have found different ways in which to to address some of the challenges you find. And you can see that by the end of this, I'm sure some of us or most of us have different ideas on how they can be able to start from where they are and with what they have. So I'm really glad that you were able to share with us what you are doing and uh, how you are actually carrying out some of these things and uh, like what are some of the successes uh, that come about with some of these uh, strategies you're taking. So with this, we come to the end of that particular section where we had the guest panelists and now we go into the exciting section uh, where we get to be able to interact with uh, some of our the panelists or even our committee members uh, in terms of uh, asking questions and being able to just hear from you and be able to also hear from them in case you had any questions. Uh, I know you've been writing in the chat and I can just read out um, some of the questions that you have and be able to see how we can be able to to get them answered by uh, members of the team. So I'm um, seeing here the first question. Uh, which will not is not specific to one particular person is how to participate and collaborate. And uh, in my case, I am an anthropologist. I do research on open science processes, biohacking, open in innovation or knowledge generation in hybrid spaces, international treaties and the use of digital information sequences. So that the question is how can they participate and collaborate? We've been able to see the, there are different ways in which our guest panelists are doing this, and uh, maybe one one of you would want would want to jump in or just say a word uh, or two. Uh, I don't know who would be would feel most confident to to answer to this. Or actually, from the committee, we can also have a member of the team responding to that. Then we we can come to the panelists. Um. Well. Uh, I think that if you want to participate in a specific community, choose the community you want to go for and contact someone. They always need, we always need some uh, new people. 
in the case, in particular case of metal Ofensia, you can go to the website. Uh, I'm leaving it in the chat, I think, if I'm not messing up anything. And there's a way, there, there you can find how to join. There's also our Slack, which is very active. And whenever we have a new project, we post it there. And if you're interested in something in particular, you can ask to join. So uh, that would be what I can say about it. About it. Thank you. Thank you very much. You almost read my mind. I wanted to also just say that you can also identify some of the people you meet here or even listen to just and be able to get contacts um, uh, for, for those who are okay providing contacts, they can put them in the in the chat, but I know also the team, the Eli's team are also very good at communication and they can be able to to do some of these things. And then you can just reach out and uh, introduce yourself and also say uh, how you'd want to collaborate and areas of synergy. Emmanuel, please uh, chip in. Yeah, so Matthew, I think you, you, are, you are perfectly right in what you said. I think the open science community is one of the most highly collaborative and supportive communities. And the experiences we've had so far at RN is that when you send out an email to anyone about helping you out with anything, people are usually really happy to do that because it's the whole idea is to promote collaboration and take away the barriers. So if you want to engage yeah. in any of the communities or anyone, if you want to do anything, you can just reach out to people. You can look up their social media accounts. You can look up their emails and then send them emails or whatever platform yeah, you can kind of connect to them. And one thing that really helps is attending webinars, like you said. This is the place where you get to meet a lot of people. So you, you see them on the platform. You just connect with them on, let's say, any platform like LinkedIn, and it, it kind of gets the conversation started from there. So uh, that is how you can get support. That is how um, at Aaron we're able to get a lot of support by just reaching out to these organizations. And uh, the mo um, I would say about 90 to 100%, the response was positive. So yeah, it's yes. a highly collaborative community. So don't worry about getting support. Just get started. Um, like Huan was saying, just get started and you'll be able to get the support when you get there, yeah. Thank you, Claude. Thank you. So I'll go to the next question. Uh, this uh, question we, we are going to request uh, Chuang Pon to respond to. Part of my research is scoping review on OS and curiously enough, I did not capture that many papers from Chinese institutions authors. Is that due to a language barrier? Are the majority of the articles published in Chinese and local journals? Please uh, respond to this to the best of your ability. They normally say nobody has all the answers. So, yeah, yeah. So I I already briefly uh, re responded in the chat chat box. Great. But, um, yes. So uh, there are proportion of paper was published in Chinese journals. So, uh, but it vary it varies across different fields. Yeah, for psychology. Um, I think most of the people, uh, like over like like sixty percent or even higher proportion of the paper were published in English because we have a limited number of Chinese psychological journals. It's highly competitive because of limited number of out outlets. Yeah, I hope I answered the question. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So to Olavo. Um... I uh, would love to connect and collaborate with the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Strategy Framework. The initiative is uh, to align with my current research. How do I do that? I, I believe part of that was answered with the first question, but Olavo, please feel free to add something. Uh, I, I think that's already answered in the chat. I mean, the policy is oh, great. So, I, I, but uh, I think Shane answered as well. So I think, I, I think that's solved. I do have a question though. I just put it in the chat if I please say it so that we can all hear it. The ones who we have not yet read the chat. Yeah, well, okay, can I ask live or is there someone yes. online? Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, my, it's kind of a provocation actually. So like we've been brought here by uh, an organization from the Global North, which is eLife. I know most of the committee through them. I actually know most of the people here also through uh, somehow uh, North South connections. I mean, I've met Emmanuel via uh, the National Brazilian Networks, which are joined in by uh, UK Iran. Uh, I met uh, Champagne uh, by a paper which was commissioned by a Global North Journal. I, and I actually got to know Matt because we were in talks with, with uh, Sean Zuckerberg as well. 
So like all my connections here have somehow gone through the global north. I mean, is, is this kind of like inevitable? Is there a way that we can network better among ourselves? Maybe I'd like to hear a thoughts on that. Well, I would like to say something. And uh, before Emmanuel, Emmanuel uh, you can go ahead. I'll speak afterwards, no problem. Yeah, great. Um, thank you very much, Matthew. It's a wonderful question, Malabu. Uh, I think that's, well, that's what Aaron is trying to kind of uh, look at because we wanted to see ways that we can connect also locally. And aside setting up our local networks, we're also trying to identify existing um, open science communities in, in Africa. So we have um, the Open Science Committee in Egypt, Open Science Committee in Nigeria. Um, so these are communities that are focused in Africa, established in Africa. They are country specific, but rather than kind of operate in isolation, we identified them and we reached out to them that we wanted to work with them. And one thing that we've been pushing is cross-community interaction. So we tell our members who are from Egypt that there is this community in, in, the, in Egypt who, who are also pushing for open science. If you're an Aryan community member, and you are from Egypt, we would like you to also join them and kind of engage with them. So um, that is that that is possible if there are existing open science communities. But if they are not existing open science communities, then maybe the idea of establishing local networks um, as part of your, your initiative organization would really help. So that we have you have these localized groups working within their institutions or countries and then kind of establishing connections around them. So I'm sure maybe there are proposed um, initiatives across various, I mean institutions or countries within within your community. So maybe that reaching out to them and connecting and collaborating with them will kind of help these localized interactions to yeah. Thank you. I think Mercury's lost connection. Right. Um do any of the other panelists wish to respond or anybody in attendance? Um if anybody is attending the webinar, feel free to let us know in the chat and we can enable your microphone. Um, otherwise we'll be happy to move on to one of the next questions. I think I will respond to uh, all of us question a bit. So when drafting uh, our paper about Chinese open science network, we actually have um, uh, we have uh, like a very quick summary of the existing or existing uh, that grassroots network at that time. So we found that, that a large proportion of the existing open science Grass network was in global north, so I think from pure probability, uh, we have a larger chance to meet in the uh, network initiated by global north instead of by global south. Just by chance, so which means we need to have a more grassroots network in the global south. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I can... lost connection a little there, so I I, I did miss. A section. Sorry about that. I I had wanted to just add uh onto that conversation and say, um, some of these things start with us. Like we, we have what it takes to be able to get some of these things uh done. I don't know if this has been said before. When we talk about building capacity, we should also think about building capacity in terms of management and also leadership so that we we have the capability of being able to initiate some of these things and be able to carry them forward and be able to also be willing to start doing some of these things without necessarily thinking about the funds part of it because sometimes you will need to do it you will need to start doing the work before you start looking for the funds sometimes because when we say that we need to have funds first we find that when we don't have funds you're not really able to move and we need to be able to stop thinking like we need the money first before we get something done so I, I normally try so hard whenever I get the opportunity to speak to people to think about what do we have and what what can we do with what we have we can't be able to do training we have expertise and we can be able to help people. We can also support each other because sometimes when you talk about peer review, when we talk about also bias, one of the things that we uh, deal with as bias, starting from myself, is when you look at a paper and you see where it has come from, you already judge it in a particular way. So you will give it a higher score or a lower score based on. So we, we, are, already, we are already biased against ourselves. And we need to change how we do that. We need to support each other. If you come up with a 
particular program or something like that, I should be one of the first people to register as a member. I should be able to come and train there so that I, I help you grow and then you become that who is also being looked for by the global north to to be able to partner with. <laughs> okay, that's, I can go on forever, so. <laughs> We had one last question, I think, uh, before we actually, we can't look at another question, only have one minute. Shane, I'll give it back to you. I think I have said a lot that can be used as a parting shot, but you can be able to just finalize for us. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Mercury. And thank you to everybody who's attended and hosted um, today's panelists. We really appreciate your time and insights. Um, we've taken a note of the questions. Um, and we are recording today's session to be uploaded to YouTube and posted on the Global South Committee for Open Science dedicated webpage, um, which we can link to in the chat here. So we'd recommend, uh, in order to stay up to date with our latest activities and to be notified of our open call, uh, we'd recommend visiting the community page and subscribing to eLife's community newsletter, uh, as well as following eLife community on X, uh, formerly Twitter. Um, so with all this in mind, uh, we just really want to reiterate our thanks to everyone again today and extend our thanks to everybody who has participated in the founding of the committee since um, last year. And we all really hope you'll follow us along on our journey. And we very much look forward to continuing this conversation and establishing uh, really valuable connections um, with ethos aligned organizations, uh, grassroots initiatives in order to allow us to prosper. Uh, we thank you all very, very much and hope you've enjoyed today's session. Uh, we'd really appreciate if you could take a few minutes just to fill out our short feedback form to help us improve our content moving forwards. Um, and if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to community at elifesciences.org, where we'll be really happy to address any questions. Thank you, everybody, so much again, and take care until next time. Thank you.